for you. Thanks so much for joining us, Kim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've really been looking forward to this event all week. Uh, this is a talk about therapeutic gardening. And uh, Kim is going to be walking us through different types of gardening therapy and different methods. And I'm just so excited that this is um, coming at such a time as this. I know a lot of folks are looking at just different ways to relieve stress and anxiety. And I'm excited to hear how this can actually work as a therapy and uh, help us to really embrace the spring season that we're in. So thanks so much for doing this, Kim. And I'm gonna turn it right over to you, go for it. Great, thank you, Joy. So you may have heard the terms like a horticultural therapy, therapeutic gardening, meditation gardens, wellness gardens. And right now I'm going to do the official definition and the technical stuff. I'm going to get it out of the way right now. And I am going to have to read it. So please forgive me. It says, according to the American Horticultural Therapy Association, a therapeutic garden is a plant dominated environment purposefully designed to facilitate interaction with healing elements of nature. Some types of therapeutic gardens include sensory, healing, restorative, enabling, and habilitation gardens. And another author says, more and more studies show how these gardens are helping people physically, mentally, and emotionally. Because of this research, we see the principles used in a variety of settings, hospitals, outpatient centers, hospice facilities, skilled nursing homes, schools, nurseries, prisons, individual homes, and more. And finally, an abstract from a paper published by NIH about gardening and the elderly says, horticulture therapy employs plants and gardening activities in therapeutic and rehabilitation activities and could be utilized to improve the quality of life of the worldwide aging population, possibly reducing costs for long-term assisted living and dementia unit residents. Preliminary studies have reported the benefits of horticultural therapy and garden settings in reduction of pain, improvement in attention, lessening of stress modulation, of agitation, lowering of as needed medications, antipsychotics, and reduction of falls. Best of all, you don't even need to actually garden in order to benefit. Just sitting quietly on a park bench in a beautiful setting or wandering through a botanical garden has been shown to reduce negative emotions and stressful thoughts. Therapeutic gardening can be as simple as a single potted plant in a patient's room or a full-blown lush garden with water features and walking paths on a hospital campus. So let's look more at personal and practical reasons that you're going to want to start a garden at your home. So I recently read an article uh, talking about the 1918 influenza pandemic. And here's a quote. Again, I'm blind. I need to get closer to read this. Put simply, medics found that severely ill flu patients nursed outdoors recovered better than those treated indoors. A combination of fresh air and sunlight seems to have prevented deaths among patients and infections among medical staff. Now, did you catch that? Fresh air and sunshine reduce the risk of contracting the virus in the medical staff and improves, improved uh, patient's outcome. Now, of course, I don't know if that translates to the coronavirus, but it, it still cannot hurt you, put it that way. One reason being outside, of course, helps us increase our vitamin D production. And according to UCLA, vitamin D is also known as the sunshine vitamin because the body manufactures the vitamin after being exposed to sunshine. And vitamin D, the increase in vitamin D 
has been shown to boost our immune systems. So it's going to keep us physically healthier. So we don't have necessarily have as much um, damage if we do catch something. So other benefits of vitamin D are um, reducing depression, improving cognitive function, and protecting the brain. So we all know these are some hard times and gardening might just provide us with the relief from anxiety that we're looking for. To me, the solution is to spend more time out in nature. So basically, when you're gardening, you're, you're tend to focus on another living thing, not necessarily a living being, but you're focusing on caring for something else, which is a good distraction for us and helps us stop worrying for at least a little bit. There are so many different ways that you can garden and we're gonna run through a few. We briefly mentioned houseplants and that's the first one I'm gonna cover. I want you to note that before bringing any houseplant into your home, you need to study it, learn, its care needs, what type of water or what type of um, sun or shade does it need, how often should you be watering it, things like that. And a warning to those of you with pets, some house plants are dangerous, so you're going to need to research that. So I found a list of, the article was called something like eight house plants to help with your mental health. And the list includes a peace lily, red-edged dracenia, dracaena, snake plant, which is also called mother-in-law's tongue, and, um, and English ivy. And all of those and many more actually have ear, uh, air cleaning properties. So they'll take out nasty particulates out of the air. That English ivy I was telling you about, it's particularly well known for removing dust and mold in your environment. So some of the other plants they mentioned were aloe vera. And of course, we know that as the, the moisturizer or the little squirt bottle of aloe vera that we put on after we've been in the sun for a little bit too long. But you can actually eat bits of the plant and it helps with things like digestion. It uh, is going to support your immune system. It detoxifies the body. So again, I'm going to have you do a lot of researching. Uh, you're going to need to research how to eat it and how much you can have. Uh, it really doesn't have any, um, any maximum that you can eat. But if you start off eating a lot, you could, could actually have some uh, toilet problems, and we know we're trying to conserve our toilet paper right now. So the next plant is lavender, and this is especially helpful if you place a pot of lavender in your bedroom. It's going to help improve your sleep, and it's going to help with things like nervousness, anxiety, headaches, and depression. The next plant that they talked about was rosemary. Yeah, that same rosemary that you use to cook with. So it has these nice fronds and you're going to just take and, and pull your hand over that and the oils are going to be in your hand. You're going to rub your hands together, cup it over your nose and mouth. And like you learned from Aaron last week, breathe deeply, hold, and then release the breath. And rosemary is very well known for working on memory and concentration. And don't forget to use it in cooking for some great benefits to your body. Rounding out the list in this article was jasmine, which just has a beautiful calming fragrance that is just going to get you in a great mood. But really, these are well known for mental health, but any houseplant that makes you smile is, is going to be great for your well-being. The next type of wellness garden that we're going to talk about is flower gardening. Now, tending flowers is going to give you a sense of responsibility. When we nurture or care for another living thing, 
we somehow start feeling more connected to the earth in general. And planning that garden is really going to help keep your mind occupied. So that's, that's always a good thing. Just sitting in a flower garden helps us relax and become peaceful, while physical activity in the garden can give us a way to kind of clear our thoughts, uh, gives us a way to decompress and kind of escape from, from things. You're also, well, out in the garden, you're getting exercise, and that helps anything, any kind of uh, problem, physical, mental, emotional. And when you're out in the garden doing this physical labor, you're actually increasing your good hormones, your happy hormones, like your serotonin and dopamine. And you're actually reducing or dropping the levels of that stress hormone, hormone cortisol. At the end of the day in the garden, you may come into the house feeling tired, but it's that good kind of tired, not the exhausting, draining kind. If you have physical limitations, then try container gardening or tabletop garden. Just take an old picnic table and put pots of flowers and plants on that, and you know that is just as effective. Now, also, if you're doing flower gardening, go ahead and research what flowers that you can cut and bring into the house. The, the color and the fragrance of bringing flowers into the house is surely going to lift your spirit. Well, now it's truth time. I'm really not much of a flower gardener. I teach vegetable gardening. So this next section on edible gardening is really my favorite. An edible garden is one that contains things like fruits and nuts and seeds and vegetables and herbs and, yes, edible flowers, which I do grow. Flowers are great for attracting pollinators into your edible garden. And food gardening has all the same benefits as the, um, as the flower gardening with the added bonus of providing nutritious food that's also going to nurture your physical body. So for maximum health benefits, I do recommend using organic gardening methods and organic products to take care of any pest or disease problem. And that goes for the flower garden as well. The idea is to not put additional chemicals into your body. And those sprays that you use can be absorbed into the skin, or of course you can breathe it in. So for me, raised bed gardening or container gardening is what you're going to want to use because you can produce a larger crop in a smaller space than you can with something like a traditional row garden. And that, if you're not familiar with it, that's where you rototill the land and you um, have to pick out the, the sod and the stones and the, the roots and you have to add additives all through your, your uh, row garden. And the great thing is there are a lot more plant companies that are breeding new, smaller varieties of fruits and vegetables that are specifically made for uh, container gardening and for those with small space gardens. Uh, for instance, I have two columnar apple trees and they're in containers. Well, actually, they were in containers initially. I did transplant them out into my yard. And they're only two feet wide and six feet tall. So that's really great. There are a lot of patio fruit trees, um, lemons and oranges and, uh, you know, peaches and pears. And they're, they're really, really tiny. So they're great. Now, if you don't want to grow food, in your own yard or you have HOA restrictions that don't allow you to grow edibles, then look for a local community garden to join. You know, now a lot of them are allowing 
because they are spread far apart. Everybody's allotment is is sectioned off. So you're you're doing that social distancing. And many community gardens are allowing, you know, two, three, four, a certain number of people to be in the garden at the at the same time. So what if you are totally intimidated by the thought of of killing plants? You know, you're oh, I've got a black thumb. I can't do that. So the last type of therapeutic gardening I'm going to introduce you to is a Japanese stone garden, which is also called a meditative garden or a Zen garden. Now, it's best located in an area that's surrounded by greenery like moss or grass and only have a, a limited number or a very few species of trees and bushes uh, surrounding it is, is the best. My point is putting a Zen garden inside of a wild, super colorful, boisterous English garden kind of defeats the purpose of Zen. Excuse me for just a second. <clears throat> so the main part of the Zen garden is the sand or gravel that surrounds everything you're going to use a special wooden rake to create nice flowing patterns you know little circles and flowing patterns that mimic uh, the ripples in water and this kind of simulates the calm energy of nature you can add a simple statue for the purposes of focus and meditation. And the garden can include a simple water feature, maybe a little burbling fountain that is going to produce a little bit of, of a nice calming sound. The words to keep in mind are simplicity and calmness. And the key to creating that meditative garden is to keep everything, you know, fairly monochromatic and only use natural materials in it like wood and stone and sand. So you can use maybe like a single pop of a bright color, but don't go overboard. Maybe just a, you know, maybe one of the trees that you're going to feature would be appropriately a cherry tree or, you know, maybe an azalea that's going to give a, a bright pop of pink or something like that. If you don't have space for a Zen garden and don't want to take care of plants, then they really do have for sale. They have these small tabletop Zen gardens. And basically it's a tray with a lip around it. And they provide you with a, like a bag of sand and you pour that in there. And they also give you a little um, wooden rake that you can make these nice little ripples in. So that's really great. But the goal of that Zen garden, again, is to give you peacefulness and calm. And that's through focus and meditation. You know, as you can see, there is a therapeutic garden style that's going to suit everyone. You just need to decide what it is that you want to do and start researching now how you're going to accomplish it. So let me take one more sip. And I promise that I'm going to teach you guys how to create an emergency garden. And this is not, by any means, this is not an alarmist garden. But it's a garden that you can use to empower yourself through all of this. My goal today is to get you started quickly and easily. And I want you to think of this as a temporary garden. If you've been sent home from work, you know, you've got the kids home from school, there are plenty of activities that you can do with the kids or by yourself out in that garden. And um, this is going to hopefully help your family through these tough times with the bonus of getting the kids off of screens for, you know, at least a, a little. You can improve your family's immunity through uh, vegetable gardening. And I always encourage everybody to 
at least grow a little bit of your own food, even a container of lettuces grown by a sunny window inside is going to help you. So growing a garden, again, can uh, boost your immunity in several ways that we talked about, uh, the fresh air and the sunshine. And gardening will definitely get you out in that fresh air and sunshine like we talked about. First, I, I'm asking you, please do not start a row garden. If you already have one, go ahead and use it. If you already know how to garden, yeah, go ahead and use it. But if you're a beginning gardener, it's going to be a source of frustration. It's very labor and resource intensive. You have to buy a lot of tools and either rent or buy a rototiller. You are using your native soil, which I'm going to address a little bit later. And third reason I don't want you doing a row garden is gardening should be fun. And row gardening is a lot of work. If you want your kids to be involved, especially, and you do row gardening, you're, all you're going to hear is, it's too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. Okay, well, that might be your husband or wife but it's usually the kids. Plus, if you have a small garden, you're going to be able to put a fence around it and protect it to keep the kids out when you don't want them in there. And that would be easier to do than with a large row garden. So we're talking about small space gardening. And the two biggest classifications of small space gardening are probably raised bed gardening and container gardening. And both of these methods are going to contain or corral your growing medium or your soil, and which is better to do than having your, um, your soil, your good soil, your growing medium come in, in contact with that, um, what could be contaminated earth. And as you can tell by the name of my business, Square Foot Gardening, the number four and the letter U, um, my favorite type is square foot gardening. It's a great raised bed gardening method. And I really hope that you will think about learning small space gardening or square foot gardening in the future. But what I'm going to teach you today is how to really do a down and dirty, quick and easy emergency garden. And if you don't already have raised beds or containers, you don't have to worry at all. My first hint is to grow, let's see, <laughs> to grow your garden in these little cheap or free canvas bags. It's the easiest way to do it. Now, it's only going to last you a season, but Remember, this is a temporary garden. That, that's all it needs to last. Excuse me again. <clears throat> now, if you use this canvas container for a season and you find out that you really love gardening, that's the time that you can plan for next year. Use this temporary grow, these temporary grow bags and save up your money to work on a bigger and better garden next year. So let me give you a few hints. If your crop is going to be grown for the seeds, the leaves, or the roots, which are your peas, your lettuces, or something like carrots, you can get away with putting your bags in an area that gets about four to six hours of sun. Now, if it's grown primarily for its fruits, which are your tomatoes, your eggplants, your peppers, then you're going to need a fi to find an area that gets six to eight hours of sun. Um, in most cases, unless you are living on a piece of property that has been previously used for farmlands, in most cases, you do not want to use your native soil. You just don't know what's what harmful things are in it. And right now you don't have time to have a soil test done and get the results back. So many times older homes 
have lead paint chips from the the old paint that peels off of the uh, window casings and and even if you have like painted wood house. So new construction isn't even any better. There may be paint, adhesives, drywall mud, and other things like that. And then when they throw on that cheap fill dirt on top of it, it's it does not contain any nutrients for your crops to grow. Now, earlier I talked about soil and growing medium. Right now, I mentioned dirt. So what's the difference? A good soil or growing medium contains tons, millions and billions of microscopic microbes and beneficial, uh, beneficial microbes and protozoa and great things, fungi and things like that, that are really going to help your plant. Now, I know you're sitting there going, oh my gosh, I don't want fungus in my garden. Yes, you do. There's this web of thin white mycelium that is a, a type of fungus, and it actually is what you want to see in your garden. It's a sign of healthy soil. So dirt is devoid of any materials needed for growing nutritious food. Basically, in a nutshell, basically in a nutshell, <laughs> there we go. Dirt is dead and soil is alive. So I want you to buy the best soil that you can afford. And I am going to recommend organic soil if at all possible. A good thing to do also is to find a good local source of compost. And if you don't already make your own, already made compost is the best. But bagged compost usually tends to have a lot of peat in it. In an emergency, you can grow in 100% compost as long as it really is compost. The better your soil is, of course, the more nutrients that the, the um, roots of your plants are going to uptake or take in, and the better and more nutritious your food is going to be. And the better food you provide your body, the more nutrients are going to be absorbed by your body. So sometimes compost facilities actually make really good soils and soil blends. So ask them about that. Then you're just going to fill up your bag. Um, really, you're going to fill the bag up two inches with your growing medium and, and water two inches in water and two inches of water all the way up this bag. If this is too tall for you, you can put um, some stones in the bottom of it, or I've even used uh, the packing peanuts, not the kind that, that dissolve in water, but um, I've got some old fashioned pa uh, packing peanuts and you can, that will make the bag a little bit lighter. So you're going to need to research again, that word research, I'm, I'm making you do a lot of work, right? So Check out what each crop needs as far as its water requirement. And this is especially important if you're growing tomatoes, which require a lot of moisture. If you're gonna, if you think that you're the type that's going to forget to, to water your garden, just set your phone app and um, you know, make sure you're doing that. Involve your kids, they love to be out in the garden. And if you use an easy method, they're not going to complain well, as much. And children that grow food tend to eat more vegetables. You know, we've talked about soil and water. Now the next thing you're going to need are seeds. At this stage, anything goes. Of course, using organic seeds is best, but whatever you're going to use to grow has got to be eat better for you than what's currently in your grocery store. Many seed sellers are out of stock right now, but they expect to be up and running in a couple of weeks. So run to your nearest dollar tree, dollar store, family dollar. They usually carry seeds. What should you buy? Well, any crops that you currently like to eat. I'm all for experimenting with new veggies and trying new things, but right now I would suggest only growing a few things if you're a beginning gardener and only grow what you like. 
So if you if your area is still cold and you want to start seeds indoors, you can do that with two paper cups. One of them that's going to have some holes in the bottom of it, and the other one is not going to have holes. So you take the one without holes, you put something in like a stone or this is a water bottle cap, and then you're going to put the one with holes in it. Then you're going to put the soil in it and seed and water. Now, if you water too much, the reason I got that second cup in there is to, to capture the water and you will have to empty this one out periodically. So you're going to need, if you have to start seeds indoors, you're going to need a sunny window or a very strong light source. And that's really all the time I'm going to uh, to devote to actually growing, but here are a few other suggestions. Remember, this is just a way for you to immediately get started and is not meant to be your permanent way of gardening. Research various small space methods and figure out what you can do. Um, for every crop that you grow, consider how much you currently buy. So I don't want you to grow 41 lettuce plants because they're all going to come to harvest at the same time and you don't want that. Start small. Then I would also suggest, of course, that you take a class. And that's basically it. So right now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Joy. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kim. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, I, <laughs> I love... Um, how you address the the challenges that it can be with with having a, a traditional garden and the tilling and towing and <laughs> <laughs> I, that cracks me up because I, I can see that with my kids you know grumbling at how hard work that is yeah. because I feel yeah. like the small space approach is is really yeah. great too for those folks that really don't even have the space that don't maybe have as much of a yard correct and it's it's encouraging and empowering I think that you know, you can have a small space that is really, that can yield a lot. So, um, so thanks for that encouragement and those tips. Um, You're I wanna, welcome. I would like to, before we announce, because we, we are going to be hosting a class next week um, that is yeah. right up her, her alley in her zone. And so we're going to uh, talk to you about that in just a second. But before we do that, I do want to bring up the questions that came up in the chat. Um, so okay. we had one question from Ricky that says, do you find citronella plants help keep the bugs away? You know, I, I don't know. There's several plants that are called mosquito plants. Um, citronella is of course the most well-known, lavender, um, lemon, eucalyptus, and things like that. It doesn't hurt to grow that stuff, but I, I just personally do not know if that works. The best thing you can do to keep mosquitoes out of your garden is to make sure that there's no standing water in your garden, or in your yard. Okay. And then um, it's, the other question here is, do you have a recommendation for an organic spray for an apple tree in particular? Um, she says, ours gets eaten up by bugs and there's always holes in them. <laughs> that you're going to have to research. No, I really do not know offhand. I am not uh, much of a fruit tree gardener. I don't have, I don't have a lot of space. So I do have a little bit of citrus and things like that, but haven't had that problem. Okay with my apples either. Yeah, so. so just kind of doing a general search for that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I, I'm so excited that we're gonna be following up next week uh, with a class on small veggie gardening and a, a bonus section on microgreens, right? So that's gonna mm -hmm. be our focus for the class next week. This is gonna be on Tuesday night next week at 6 30 p.m eastern time and so we will post the link to that event in the comments. Um, so just keep a lookout for that. And uh, that event, uh, normally Kim would charge $15 uh, per class. Uh, per person per class. Per, per person per <laughs> class um, for this particular uh, topic. And so um, what she's agreed to do is uh, in honor of our Spring Rise Up campaign that we're running with Life of Joy, uh, she is going to be donating all the, um, the proceeds that come in through that, and she's going to do it for a discounted rate of $10 per household. Um, and that's not a requirement. It's just a requested donation for our Spring Rise Up campaign. So uh, we will have an Eventbrite link attached to the Facebook event page uh, where you can register for that. 
Um, so surely uh, join us for that if you can. If you cannot make a donation, we certainly still want to make no the opportunity available to you just um, as a gift to you in this season. Um, but if you can, uh, you know, uh, contribute, that would be fabulous too. So, um, so thank you so much for this, Kim. This is great. I uh, I really appreciate um, just the perspective around the different types of um, therapy gardens, and mm -hmm. you know, really finding one that works for you, and really just being attentive, not not just jumping the gun and just kind of going for the first thing that you think of, but really being aware of what the needs of that garden are going to be so that it's not a, a place of frustration, right? right? You know, um, the whole idea is it's meant to be therapeutic. So <laughs> going with the one that's really right for you is key. Um, so thanks for that. And, um, and yeah, do you have any uh, notes of preparation for the class on Tuesday at all? Not really. Just show up with a pen and paper. Awesome. Keeping it simple. Yeah. <laughs> right. Don't want to stress you out. Yeah, right. So um, so everybody, thank you so much for joining us. If you have additional questions, um, you know, if you're plugging in uh, after the fact here, if you're catching the recording, please feel free to comment um, on our live here. And we'll be keeping an eye on it um, ongoing so that we can continue to answer any kind of questions that you might have. Um, so just know that we will keep an eye on the comments for that if you have some specific questions. And then uh, we'll also share her uh, her Facebook page uh, so that you can follow her there and reach out to her personally if you have any questions. So, And if you do want to learn a little bit more about gardening, I do have online classes and recorded classes. So talk to me about that. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, Kim. We appreciate your time. And we hope the rest of you enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy a really beautiful weekend. Uh, this Easter weekend. Uh, yeah. We hope that you uh, have found some value in this and uh, that you get to enjoy some fresh air this weekend. Thanks, Kim. You're welcome. <laughs>